of the beholder. Can you guys love art? Yeah. You can go to any tent, you can see personalized paintings, To you can see chalk, you, you name it and you'll find it, it's right here. This 20 year old is already well on her way to becoming an artist with a capital A. Her art pieces have sold for as much as $500 a pop. So how does one set a price on art? Do I really like it or do I really not like it? And if I really like it, then I usually price it a little bit higher because it's worth more to me. But if it's not as great to me personally, even if someone else loves it, I'll put it a little bit lower. But at this art walk, art took on every form imaginable. Break dance moves? Check. Scalp art? Check. Low rider car show? Check. Art on jewelry? On easels? On chalkboards? Check. Check. And check. I brought my daughter because she's an artist and I wanted her to see what other artists do and the heart and soul that they put into their work. For myself, just learning about the different like cultures and communities and where their different art styles come from is very interesting and will definitely influence my art, I think. I like the jewelry. I don't know if that's considered art, but I like the jewelry. You know when they make the jewelry? Yeah. But all this art had an economic development focus as well. It was part of the Reseda Rising Initiative, a plan to turn this part of the valley into a thriving economic area. For example, behind me, where you can't see over there, we're, we're working on getting an ice skating rink uh, put together, a community publicly owned ice skating rink, and then just down the way over there where the old Reseda Theater is, we are putting in a, uh, uh, we're working with a Lemley, getting a Lemley Theater. But enough about business. For most, this was a day to get out some paints and relax. Or better yet, watch other people do it. Music, food trucks, and a community pavilion with all kinds of resources for families were also part of the fun. A busy downtown thoroughfare gets a major upgrade. The mayor talks women empowerment and a new playground for kids at Cleveland Park. All these stories in City Beat. Councilmember Jose Huizar joined LA's Department of Transportation, Bureau of Street Services, and downtown LA residents to celebrate the transformation of Spring Street, a major downtown LA thoroughfare. The upgrade reconfigured Spring Street to create protected bike lanes curbside on the east side of the street with parking next to traffic flow. This upgrade is phase one of Huizar and LADOT's $2.3 million Main and Spring Forward project. When completed, the project will improve intersections and crossings for pedestrians, upgrade the existing buffered bicycle lanes to protected bicycle lanes, and reduce bus-bicycle conflicts. So it's incumbent upon us that we think of how do we make better use of our public spaces and get away from prioritizing cars to prioritizing people, bicycles, and other modes of transportation. Mayor Eric Garcetti and First Lady Amy Elaine Wakeland kicked off the second annual State of the Women and Girls Address and Young Women's Assembly. Women's achievements, challenges, and future opportunities were the focus of the conference. The event brought together civic leaders, hundreds of young girls and women for in-depth conversations, panels and presentations on the state of gender equality in Los Angeles and what we all need to do to make a change. We need to look back and say 27 years ago, we stood up for the voices that said me too, for the voices that said time's up. LA's Department of Rec and Parks, along with Councilmember Gil Cedillo, gathered for the grand opening of Cleveland Avenue Bicentennial Park's new playground. This playground project was completed with support and advocacy of community members, the Arroyo Seco Neighborhood Council, and the Skelton Group. This new playground features a host of challenges for children ages 2 to 12 and comes with a shade canopy. Councilwoman Neri Martinez has teamed up with the Department of Cultural Affairs to unleash a huge dose of art and culture in Van Nuys by kicking off a spectacular light show at the second annual Van Nuys Arts Festival. Imagine the government buildings at Van Nuys City Hall transforming into a misty forest of light beams and digital rays. The whole point of this year's theme is this virtual forest and incorporating technology into the art community. This was the second annual Van Nuys Art Festival. Live projection mappings, virtual artwork, and a 3D dance party were just some of the attractions. What up, 
this time. Reverse. This is really catered to showcase the talent here in the valley because you know I, so many times we actually have to go over the hill to go see someone's artwork or to go see check out a um, opening of a gallery. And not only was artwork of all kinds available, but people of all kinds, big and small, got to turn artists for a night at this graffiti art battle and block party. Art and culture and creativity is alive in the San Fernando Valley. The Discovery Cube Museum's Animal Tracks Footprint Workshop left the kids smiling. And for those with an appetite for more traditional fare, the beer garden offered hearty ale and hearty entertainment. All of this artsy stuff gave art lovers something to dance about including council member Nuri Martinez. Organizers expected the festival to attract about 3,000 people. The Van Nuys Arts Festival was free. Celebrate Dia de los Muertos over at Hollywood Forever Cemetery, bring the family out to a Halloween festival at MacArthur Park, or embark on a haunted hayride. All this in this week's Things to Do. The 19th annual Dia de las Muertes honors the Aztec goddess Cotlicu, who gave birth to the moon, stars, and the god of the sun and war. Her most famous monumental representation was at the Temple Mayor in Mexico City. After the Spanish conquest, the temple was destroyed and her statue was buried because it was considered an inappropriate pagan idol by Spanish invaders. After languishing in obscurity for more than 200 years, she was rediscovered in 1790. This event is part of LA's Department of Cultural Affairs Latino Heritage Month, a citywide commemoration of Latino history, heritage, and tradition in Los Angeles. It takes place at the Hollywood Forever Cemetery on October 27th at 12 p.m. The City of LA's Department of Rec and Parks, Councilman Gil Cedillo, and Westlake South Neighborhood Council invite you to Halloween Festival at MacArthur Park. There will be lots of fun events, including a costume contest, face painting, haunted house, arts and crafts, trick-or-treating, and a special screening of the movie Hotel Transylvania 2. All the family fun takes place Saturday, October 27th from 5 to 9 p.m. at MacArthur Park, located at 2230 West 6th Street. For thrill seekers, check out the Los Angeles Haunted Hayride. The famed Griffith Park attraction takes folks on a hayride through the old zoo, where they'll face the underworld and portrayals of the seven deadly sins. Are you ready to experience the thrill of the ride? The adventure and rides go until October 31st at the Old LA Zoo, located at 4730 Crystal Springs Avenue in Griffith Park. For more, visit LosAngelesHauntedHayRide.com. And that's a look at some things to do. Well, that's going to do it for this edition. I'm Yana Kay. From all of us here at LA This Week, thanks for joining us. A reminder that you can catch us online at LACityV.org and check out our newest social media videos, LA This Minute. We'll see you back here next week for more of LA This Week. Need a recycling center? Call 311, the toll free number for non emergency services. 311, your one call to City Hall. Hola, familia.
familia, we're Team Price, inviting you to the 5th Annual South LA Dia de los Muertos Festival. This free, family-oriented community event features live musical performances, altars and activities for all ages. We'll have face painting, loteria card games, a calaquita contest, a photo booth, and much more. Artists performing include Sonora Santanera La Nueva Sangre, Jukebox, and Mariachi Trio Palenque de Aurelio Reyes. It's going to be a family affair with plenty of great food, music, games, and best of all, it's free. See you Friday, October 26th at South Park. cerca.
Good morning, good morning. Uh, please take your seats. Today is Friday, October 26th. I want to welcome you to City Hall and your Los Angeles City Council. Uh, Madam Clerk, uh, we do have a quorum. If you please call the roll. Blumenfeld, Bond, and Buscaino, Cedillo, Englander, Harris, Dawson, Weezer, Coretz, Krikorian, Martinez, O'Farrell, Price, Rodriguez, Rue, Wesson, 10 members present, and a quorum, Mr. President. Thank you. First order of business. Approval of the minutes. Blumenfeld moves and Rue seconds. Next. Commendatory resolutions for approval. Krikorian moves, Martinez seconds. That brings us where? Mr. President, there is a department request to continue item one to November 21st, 2018, sir. Uh, so ordered. Continue. Items two through 16 are items which public hearings have been held. The committee reports for items two, three, 10, 11, 13, 14, and 15 have been posted and circulated for council's consideration. And also, item eight should be held on the desk for an amendment. And finally, 16 A and B are budget and finance reports that are submitted without recommendations. Motions are required for 16 A and B, sir. Okay, well, why don't we prepare to vote on these items? Uh, Madam Clerk, open the roll, close the roll, tabulate the vote. 11 ayes. Thank you. Continue. Items 17 through 19 are items which public hearings have not been held. Ten votes are required for consideration. Okay, so without objection, those items are now before this body. Do we have cards on these items? Yes, sir. There are cards on 17, 18, and 19, sir. Okay, that brings us where? That brings council back to presentations, items called special or general public comment. Yes, Mr. Kokorian. Um, I missed the vote on that one. I'd like to call item number 15 special, please. So oh. let's vote on reconsideration. Let's open the roll. Close the roll, tabulate the vote. 11 ayes. Let's hold that for a bit. I also want to take a moment, and I want you to give him a round of applause. We're joined by former state senator Kevin Murray is with us today. Give Senator Murray a round of applause. Good to see you. I believe Mr. Koretz served with him. Mr. Cedillo served with him. I served with him. And I think that's about it. But anyway, it's always a pleasure. Uh, to see you, and we appreciate all of the hard work you're doing to help uh, our homeless community. Okay, uh, let me request Ms. Martinez if I can. Good morning, Mr. Wesson. Good morning, good morning, Madam President and members. I uh, am joined today by some very good people with uh, great hearts as we begin to celebrate uh, LA County Law Library Pro Bono Week. Uh, before I try to even talk a little bit about what they do. I want to highlight a very dear friend of mine to my right is Sandy Levin, an outstanding attorney. But what many of you don't know, uh, and what you could guess by her being uh, the executive director uh, for the law library, and, and, and it's just a continuation of public service. When we first met each other, uh, she was the mayor of the city of Culver City, 
and walked precincts when I was running for the assembly with her baby in a stroller. I won every precinct in Culver City because of that baby. <laughs> so how old is that baby today? She's a senior in high school. A senior in the high school, make her about 18. So let's, give, let's just give them a round of applause for all of the good work that they do. And so we have with us the communications manager, and I'll probably butcher a name, so, so forgive me. Uh, Leanne Saldana is here. Let's give her a round of applause. She's right behind me. The photographer, is it Kurt Maraj? Maroge. Give him a round of applause. Jane uh, Stanbrick, senior director, and Janine uh, Liebert who really is the quarterback yeah. on this pro bono week. So let's give her a round of applause. I mean, give her a big yeah, round of applause. You know, we, we have the second largest uh, law library in the United States of, of America. And during pro, uh, Mr. Madam President, if you could give Mr. Herman his one warning. This is the Mr. time. Mr. Herman, for this is your first and final warning, sir. Can you please put the signs down? Thank you. Thank you very much, Madam President. You know, we, uh, the second largest law library in, in the country. And what these folks try to do is they try to help individuals navigate or negotiate themselves through the legal system. And during pro bono week, they bring together over 45 different groups of attorneys and social service uh, agencies to try to help, try to give back. And I just think that that is a phenomenal thing. And it's the type of thing that people really don't give them credit for doing. But we on this council has made it a tradition to bring them in to say thank you for your service and to highlight the work that they're doing. So let's give them another round of applause. <clears throat> they have reference materials, uh, librarians to help you go through the maze. Whatever you need, they try to provide it for you. Plus, they're a very fun group, and I'm just a better person because I know them. So with that said, I would like to present to you the former uh, mayor, my friend, you know, once a public servant, always a public servant, ladies and gentlemen, Sandy Levin. Six days a week, all year long, LA Law Library provides support and services to people who face legal issues but can't afford representation. In fact, 100,000 times each year, someone walks through the front door of LA Law Library needing help and legal resources. 100,000 times a year. And the crazy thing is that that's just a drop in the bucket. Think about all the people you know who are facing legal issues. Maybe they have a question about their housing or a problem with custody of their children. Maybe they're facing challenges with immigration or citizenship. Maybe they've got a consumer credit question or they need help accessing government benefits. Maybe they need help getting a conservatorship for a parent or a grandparent. Maybe they want help starting a business or just getting a question answered about their income taxes. Now think about how many of those people can actually afford the five, ten, or fifty thousand dollars that it would cost to hire an attorney. And you'll understand the magnitude of the problem. During Pro Bono Week, we get to celebrate and showcase the resources that are available to people from all the different organizations within our community that help self-represented individuals. We get to let people know that there is help and that they're not alone facing these problems. On Saturday alone, tomorrow, at the Public Legal Services Fair, 
people will be able to get help on hundreds of different legal issues from dozens of different providers. We want to thank the city for helping make this possible. For participating, first of all, the city attorney's office, business source, and LA Public Library all are part of Pro Bono Week. For helping us get the word out that those in need throughout Los Angeles <coughs> have help that is available to them and that is free. And for the commendation today, recognizing the remarkable work that my staff does at LA Law Library, not only during Pro Bono Week, but all year long. So thank you very much for helping with this event. <clears throat> all right, Betsy, come on, let's take a, let's take a photo. Mr. That's all good. Yes. Mr. Weston, we have one member on the queue, please, sir. Okay. Mr. Gakorian. Thank you, Madam President, and uh, thank you, Mr. President, uh, for bringing the Law Library uh, with us uh, today. Uh, back in the Middle Ages, I was on the board of the Law Library uh, many, many years ago, and every single time I walked into that building, um, I was in awe of what a treasure it is for this city, for this county, of resources that are available to everyone. Anyone who wants to walk in who can find this wealth of, of collective knowledge and information about the law. Um, but I was also struck every single, every single time I walked in by the users of that building, who were people on the whole. Um, sometimes there were lawyers in there who were rushing in from court and trying to do something quickly. But on the whole, uh, our uh, clients at the law library were people who were just trying to be on equal footing with those lawyers people who were you know, representing themselves, trying to find out what their rights are, trying to prepare uh, pleadings so that they would be able to um, represent themselves in, in court. Um, and they would never have had any opportunity to do that without the presence of the law library. And so each and every week, uh, each and every day, the law library is providing um, a source of justice to people who would be left without it but for that resource. But I think on Pro Bono Week in particular, um, it's a time for us all to really um, celebrate this resource and also to thank uh, not only the library, but all of the lawyers who come and participate in Pro Bono Week, giving of their time, uh, helping people with you know, Section 8 matters, with citizenship and immigration matters, fair housing disputes, foster uh, care advocacy, um, just about everything that you can imagine that people might need legal help in, they can come to Pro Bono Week to the library and find a lawyer who's willing to give them a hand for free. And sometimes that's the difference in whether someone keeps their home or not. It's a difference between whether someone is victimized by discrimination or not. It's just that hour or so uh, that they have of being able to hear from a lawyer. So thank you to all of you for organizing this and for you know, helping so many people in our county uh, achieve justice that would otherwise be denied to them but for your work. Thank you, thank you Mr. Kokori, and well said. All right, let's give them another round of applause. Betsy, let's take one heck of a photo here. Come on, everybody. <clears throat> everybody, snuggle up. Thank you, Mr. Wesson. Mr. Maudner, I believe you have a verbal amendment on an item? Yes, on uh, item number eight, Madam President. Um, there was uh, an omission in the CAO report and therefore in the DOT recommendation. Uh, the recommendation currently asks uh, for uh, a general manager of DOT to amend uh, the DASH and commuter express contracts. It should also say the city ride contracts as well. So I'd like to uh, make that verbal amendment. Yeah, I'll need a second on that. Second. Sure. Ms. Rodriguez? You're on the queue. 13 forthwith. Very well. 13 forthwith for uh, Ms. Rodriguez. Okay, Mr. Bonin. And you also, there is a significant um, change. Madam City Attorney? 
Do we need to reopen public general public yes, comment we on need this to item? Reopen public comment. Okay. Yeah, Correct. while the, 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 the change is technical in that it was an omission from CAO, it's a significant change in what the, Correct. the, the, the scope of what was on the agenda is. So, right. therefore so we will have to reopen public, public comment yeah. on that item, but I also believe you have, are you ready for your presentation? Uh, yeah. Go do it. Thank you, Madam President, uh, and good morning, colleagues. We have this morning with us, uh, as Veterans Day approaches, a lot of veterans in the House today. Uh, and we have a lot of veterans in the House today who are particularly committed to the arts. Uh, I've rise today to honor servicemen and service women who have not only worked uh, to make our country more safe, uh, they've worked to help their brothers and sisters in service heal and contribute to our culture through the arts. Uh, and I'm very proud to declare today as Veterans Arts and Humanities Day in Los Angeles. Ms. Ramirez, I appreciate your patronism, but I need you to sit, please sit down and not interrupt Mr. Bonin. Thank you. Happy she's applauding for something. Uh, so with me today is uh, Keith Jeffries, and, uh, who's a veteran of the Special Forces, uh, Melissa Ritz, a veteran of the uh, Air Force, uh, and as you can see, many, many, many others, veterans and leaders in the USVAA. Uh, the USVAA is an award-winning nonprofit arts organization and it was founded in 2004 by military veterans and by artists. Uh, they provide opportunities for veterans. They highlight the work of servicemen and women in the arts, humanities, and the entertainment industry. They work to find funding and support for individual artistic projects in theater and film and television, in the visual arts and the fine arts and a wide variety of crafts. Uh, and um, they serve as a platform for people to address issues of concern to veterans and their families through arts and artistic endeavors and platforms. USVAA members express themselves through art to focus on issues uh, as vast as and including the transition from military to civilian life, education, employment, the effects of wartime and military service injuries such as PTSD and TBI and military sexual uh, trauma, and notably homelessness among veterans. Uh, as we know, each of these issues is complex and is challenging, and USVAA encourages veterans to use art as a way to advocate and as a way to heal. Uh, so I want to thank you, uh, uh, Keith and, and Melissa, and everybody here for their service and for their commitment to USVAA. Uh, and as I said, I'm honored to stand here and recognize Veterans Arts and Humanities Day here in Los Angeles. We'll also do these in the back, too. Okay. And then, so I'm going to uh, ask uh, Keith and then Melissa to say a few words. Good morning, Council Members. Madam President, thank you, Councilman Mike Bonin, for this honor. We are truly humbled uh, to be here today uh, before you uh, as veterans uh, and as artists and as representatives of this great city, Los Angeles, which once again is leading the way in recognizing veterans. And uh, that's, that's really been our experience in the past 14 years since the organization began, beginning with Mike's predecessor, mm -hmm. uh, former uh, uh, council member and veteran, and Bill Rosendahl. Um, we would not be here today had it not been for the work that Bill Rosendahl did for veterans and that he did along with his staff, including Len Nguyen uh, and uh, Jim Horwitz. Uh, they uh, laid the groundwork for us as we started out. We did the first veterans-led uh, Shakespeare program for veterans at the West LA Civic Center. It was a, a, a groundbreaking operation and we're very proud of all of the things that we have done in the past uh, 14 years uh, with our work. As you can see, uh, standing behind me 
Uh, I have a number of veterans here. They represent all aspects of the arts, fine artists, sculptors, photographers, writers, actors, and directors. We are all, thank you. <laughs> we are all extraordinarily proud of our military service, but part of uh, our military service is not only celebrating what we did in the military and not only celebrating what we uh, represent as veterans, but also um, being part of the larger world around us, uh, exploring all of those possibilities uh, of becoming um, more than just veterans, of becoming engaged and representing veterans in a way and representing the city in a way that makes us all proud with our various works of art. And that can be anything. It doesn't, uh, it may start uh, with our military service, but it could be baseball to ballet, as we like to say. Um, I also uh, want to introduce uh, Melissa Ritz. She's an actor, director, uh, and writer. She's a great representative. She will be directing our upcoming show, our New Works presentation at the Actors Gang in Culver City on Monday, November 12th. Uh, that show is uh, a product of our workshop for veteran writers. We hold that 12 times a year, and then we present the works of the veterans who are participants uh, so that the public and the industry can see the work that we're doing. Um, some of the members standing behind me uh, are involved in that workshop. It really is a great tribute and another opportunity to show off the skill sets. So uh, with that said, Melissa Ritz, Air Force veteran. Thank you. Thank you, Keith. Thank you. And I'm joined, like I said, with other veterans. We've got representatives from the Marines, combat veterans also, from the Army and the Navy, um, and Air Force. And I would love for all of you to come to the Actors Gang, as Keith said, on Monday, November 12th. Be our guest. You'll see readings from uh, screenplays, war stories, and we'd love for you to be our guest. It's my third year being a part of the program, and we're really grateful that you gave us this honor today, and thank you again. Thank you very much, Mr. Bonin. Thank you, Madam President. We'll all go in the back and take some photos back there. We're going to go meet between you. Members, we're going to move on to item 15. I'm, we'll go ahead and call public comment cards first. If you hear your name, please come up to the podium on item 15 only. Denny Zane, are you here? Becca Wellington and Olivia Lee. You each have one minute to address item 15. Good morning, Denny. Nice to see you. Good to see you. Thank you, council members. It's a pleasure to be here. I want to thank this city and this city council for the leadership it consistently shows in the area of transportation. We know where we are. We are in a transportation transformation. We have done that for ourselves by voting as voters to approve measures R and measures M. But we know the mission of R&M is incomplete without the program that the state of California adopted when they approved SB1. Yes, we need that modern transportation transit system, but we need as well to make sure that our roads, streets, highways, and bridges are safe so that they don't create additional congestion, so they don't create additional costs, so they don't wreck lives by creating accidents. That is what we are here to talk about today. We are here to talk about opposing the measure, measure Proposition 6, which would repeal that effort to, to ensure a full transportation transformation. Thank you for your leadership. Thank you, Councilmember Kokorian, for your leadership in this issue, and Councilmember Good. Blumenfeld. Thank you, Denny. Next speaker. Hi, I'm Becca Whittington. I'm Director of Development and Marketing at Los Angeles Neighborhood Initiative. Lanny supports a no vote on Proposition 6 and thanks the council for supporting that as well. Proposition 6 halts thousands of currently projects currently underway throughout California, upgrading bridges and overpasses to meet earthquake standards. 
If proposition passes, it will eliminate more than $5 billion in annual transportation funds and cease funding for upgrades to road and safety and public transit improvement projects already in the way. Thank you so much. Lonnie stands proudly beside environmental organizations, public safety officials, and public interest groups in opposing Proposition 6. And thank you to Move LA for getting us organized. Thank you very much. Next speaker is Olivia Lee, followed by Mike Young and Dan McDonald. Good morning, council members. My name is Olivia Lee with the LA Area Chamber of Commerce. Uh, thank you for taking the time to hear how detrimental Prop 6 is to our region, and thank you for opposing this proposition. As the voice of business in the LA region, this chamber is staunchly opposed to Prop 6. We could stand to lose $1 billion in important infrastructure dollars if this passes. There are over 90 SB1 funded projects in Los Angeles at this time, including Vision Zero projects, the 96th Street Transit Station project, and the Southern California Global Freight Gateway Rail project. When we look at LA County, that number jumps up to over 900 projects receiving funds. These are projects that will move our economy forward, provide good paying jobs to residents, and ensure that we have adequate transportation infrastructure to move goods and people through our region efficiently and will help leverage our local investment a measure R, a measure M dollars. The chamber and the business community are against Prop 6 and support the city's opposition to Prop 6. Thank you so much for your time. Thank you. Next speaker is Mike Young, followed by Dan McDonald and Patricia McAllister. Hi. Um, on behalf of the California League of Conservation Voters, I'd like to thank council members Corian, Bonin, and especially my own council member, uh, Bob Blumenfield, for your uh, consideration of this important issue. Uh, CLCV was an early opponent to Prop 6 because of its devastating impacts on trying to reach California's climate goals. You know, as you probably are aware, it gets $5 billion annually uh, from important infrastructure improvements. And a lot of those important improvements include investments in public transportation public trans uh, and transit projects, like electric buses and light rail uh, and pedestrian-friendly pathways. In LA, that includes $100 million a year for active transportation infrastructure and gutting programs, uh, many of the v Vision Zero project programs, uh, which include urban greening and pedestrian amenities that would have their funding totally devastated from this initiative. We think this is entirely unacceptable. It's bad for the city, it's bad for the state, and it's bad for our climate goals. So we appreciate the city's support and thank you. Thank you very much. Next speaker. Good morning. Good morning, honorable council members. Dan McDonald with the Southwest Regional Council of Carpenters, and I'm here to speak on their behalf, but I'm also uh, a lifelong LA City resident and third generation LA City family. Uh, my grandfather graduated from Hollywood High School in 1940. And what he told me was that Los Angeles used to be considered the city of the future in the 20s, 30s, 40s, and 50s. And we lost our way in the 80s and 90s. And I think with the leadership of Mayor Eric Garcetti and this, this city council, we've begun to rebuild a city that is a place where innovation and opportunity takes place. We think at the Carpenters Union, and I believe that Measure 6 puts that at risk because you can't have a city that's innovative. You can't have a city that offers opportunity if it's a city in decay. So we strongly oppose Proposition 6 and would ask for the council to oppose it as well. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Next speaker is Patricia McAllister, followed by Herman and Antonia Ramirez. Yes, I want the voters to vote yes on this proposition. Let me tell you why. This proposition wants to reduce uh, transportation and the city um, Bureau of Street Services by $5.1 billion, and I think they should. I've lost a tire on these roads here. These roads are so bad, we know you're not using that money. There's $173 million for the Bureau of Street Services that was allocated in 2018-19, $289 million for the Bureau of Sanitation, and $166 million for transportation. You're not using that money like you're supposed to use, so I think we need a lot of reductions because all of this skimming off the top, I mean, the roads are so bad, you can't even walk down the streets. The streets are horrible. Even down Wilshire, you can't, once you get to a certain portion of Wilshire, it's so bad, I have to slow down. It's bad on my tires. 
you're not doing a darn thing for this city with this money, and I want people to vote yes, I will definitely vote yes to reduce it and to reduce some other budgets around here too, because as we reduce, less money will go in your pockets. Next speaker is uh, Herman, followed by Antonia Ramirez and Eric Previn. Well, first and foremost, I'd like to thank the transportation nigger over there, Mr. Bonin, as he will vote yes on this situation of provoking situations. As we all know that under Woolitz versus Los Angeles, with $1 billion in surplus, you cannot fix one motherfucking sidewalk or street or curb. A violation of every human right of access of path of travel on a goddamn public sidewalk. So if you're going to vote no and join the jackass council members like Mr. Bonin, the transportation nigger, who gets up and leaves and doesn't want to hear the criticism. Can you just the item, Mr. Herman? Once again, we will all vote yes and see if that jackass mayor, Eric Corsetti, can fix our sidewalks and streets. Next speaker is Antonia Ramirez, followed by Eric Previn and Wayne Spindler. Yes, I vote yes on Proposition 6, reduce the waste, fraud, and abuse, and put all the politicos in prison. Now, how will the new city transportation program improvements, um, like DASH buses running in downtown L.A., now extending the days and duration and the frequency, factor in with all the movie filming crews shutting down most, if not all, the streets in downtown L.A., causing massive gridlock congestions and chokeholding the entire city's transportation systems? We don't want want to see Hollywood glorifying uh, all the goddamn wetbacks and gangbangers and rocks, drugs and sex and, and uh, faggots. We want somebody to straighten out the transportation system. We got to get from point A to point B without being goddamn run over. No, not even the buses know where the hell they're going. They don't know who to pick up or where to pick them up. So again, we need some order, we need some structure, and we need some cohesiveness. Now do me a favor, vote yes on six, and uh, put the politicians you, in Ms. prison. Ramirez. God bless. Thank you very much. Your time is up. Your time is up. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Eric Previn, followed by Wayne Spindler. Thank you. Uh, thank you. It's Eric Previn from Studio City, uh, and I'm on the, the Neighborhood Council. And this item today, I'm speaking on behalf of myself, uh, is, is nicely drafted because it, it points to a motion to get a report back on proposition that's on the election. So you're not going to vote in support or against, even though we heard a lot of people uh, who are not for uh, the repeal. And in Studio City, we're confused. So that's why we're having an open forum tonight, uh, Councilmember Martinez, between 5.30 and 9. And we want to hear from both sides, but we want some of our incumbent candidates from your side to show up, because what we're facing is five or six or seven people from the one side, but nobody from the incumbent, Mr. Nazarian, Mr. Hertzberg, Mr. Sherman, they're all double, triple busy during election time for Studio City, California. It is Studio City, California, not Studio City, Wisconsin. Okay, don't leave the whole group of people in our area who are ready to hear from our incumbents to hear why we want to vote for them again. Why? Thanks. Thank you. Next speaker is Wayne Spindler. So again, it's a great thing. Vote yes on Measure 6. Proposition 6, you must vote yes. Why? because we're trying to defeat Mike Bonin, who's leading a pack of Antifa members called the Transportation Niggers. He's going around public transit on the Expo line, people trying to ride the subway, going up to white people and calling them niggers because they're going east to USC on the train. This man, Mike Bonin, is a terrorist. Vote yes on Measure 6, a.k.a. Proposition 6. You'll reduce your gas prices 30 cents at the pump immediately on January the 1st. Give yourselves a tax break. Take money out of Mike Bonin's pocket. The transportation nigger vote yes on 6. Thank you very much. That concludes speakers on this item. Mr. Kokoyan. Thank you very much, uh, Madam President. Members, um, as you know, uh, on Wednesday we 
took a position in opposition to Prop 6, and I want to thank again Mr. Blumenfield for bringing that forward so that we could uh, take that position. But as we all know, today's uh, politics are often um, built around misinformation, uh, a lack of understanding of facts, an inability to analyze data, and emotional reactions which are often directed um, towards uh, government in similar ways to the comments that we just heard. So Mr. Bonin and I felt that it was uh, important for the voters of Los Angeles as well as the members of this council to understand really what impacts Prop 6 will have if it were to pass on the motorists in Los Angeles, on transportation uh, uh, planning in Los Angeles, on the quality of our streets, and in so many other areas. I think, you know, it's worth noting as we start that um, we're talking about a reduction, a savings to voters, if they were to vote for this, of about 30 cents a day. 30 cents a day. It's also important that the voters understand what Prop 6 would cost to them. And that's what our presentation today is going to be about, the cost of, uh, of moving forward with this misguided measure, which is a step back from the commitment that we've made to a more mobile, uh, society, a society that's built on a transportation system that will take us uh, well into this century. Uh, and that's why you see representatives here of business, labor, uh, the environmental movement, uh, jobs creation uh, advocates, uh, so many others, law enforcement and, and first responders who are coming together in opposition to Prop 6 because of the tremendous cost that it will have to the people of Los Angeles. And so uh, with that, um, uh, I- Mr. Bonin would like, like to say uh, Before we invite them up, Mr. Bonin, uh, I think has a few comments and then we'll be hearing from the CAO uh, as well as representatives from the Very well, the thank MTA. you, Mr. Krikorian. Mr. Bonin? Thank you, Mr. Krikorian, for uh, suggesting that we co-sponsor this and, and bring this in uh, today so that people could actually find out what the genuine impact of this measure would be. Uh, you know, when we, when we approach these questions on the ballot, they, they tend to be for voters and sometimes even for policymakers theoretical, uh, sort of you, know, you, you can imagine a possibility of what an impact would be. In this case, both for the city of Los Angeles and for the Metro, board, Metro Agency on whose board Mr. Krikorian and I sit, this is real, this is tangible, and this is specific. And we know exactly what projects would be impacted and harmed. Uh, you, know, you, you, you get what you pay for, and we know what this revenue source is going to pay for. And if we do not have that revenue source, as we're going to hear in a moment or two, we won't be getting that stuff, or we'll be getting it a lot later and the consequences of what will happen to our infrastructure in the interim will be pretty dire. So uh, this is uh, about the city of Los Angeles, and it's about our solvency, and it's about uh, the, the, the quality of life in Los Angeles, and the same for the entire area served by Metro. So we have representatives today, both uh, from the CAO's office and from Metro, to give us a report on what's at stake. Thank you. Are we ready to invite our guests to the table? You want to? Madam President, I'd like to invite up uh, David Hirano from the CAO's office, as well as Michael Turner, the Deputy Executive Director of the M Metropolitan Transportation Authority, uh, who will be presenting on uh, some of the actual impacts of Prop 6. Good morning and welcome. Good morning. I'm David Hirano with the Office of the CAO. I'm joined at the table by my colleague, Selena Kuhn, and I'm going to let Selena go ahead and, and give you um, the presentation. Selena Kuhn with the Office of the CAO. Um, in the 2018-19 adopted budget, the city anticipated approximately $67.1 million in SB1 revenues for this fiscal year, which, it, which will be used to fund capital improvement projects. Um, should Proposition 6 be approved, it is anticipated that approximately um, $34.5 million worth of projects will, um, $34.5 million um, 
and anticipated revenues will not be received. Um, this was taken into consideration when the 2018-19 um, budget was being developed, um, so that 35.4 million worth of projects will is not authorized until January 1st of 2019. Um, should Proposition 6 be approved, we anticipate that some or all of the 34.5 million worth of projects um, will be significantly delayed. Um, these projects um, consist of a total of six million and um, that is appropriate for street reconstruction and Vision Zero de project design. Um, as you are aware, there are currently, we're in the process of implementing the first six complete street projects. So this is the next set, set of um, complete streets projects that will be impacted. Um, a total of 10 million is appropriated for sidewalk repair access request acceleration to allow additional sites to be um, completed. Um, and a total of 455,000 is appropriate for concrete streets. And a total of 18 million is appropriate for the capital projects throughout the city and various council districts. Um, if you have any questions, I'll be willing to take it. So just to be clear, the, the cut that you just described, the $34 million um, that would go to sidewalk repair, street reconstruction, and the capital improvement expenditure program for programs in most of the council districts, I think, of, of the city. Um, that is in the current fiscal year budget. Um, and if this were to pass, that, but that funding would be eliminated. Uh, that's correct. Okay. Thank you. Madam President and Hello? Madam President and members, I'm Michael Turner with the Los Angeles County Metropolitan Transportation Authority. And I'm going to run through the countywide benefits for SB1 and talk about the specific projects in the city of Los Angeles that are impacted if Prop 6 passes. Uh, I know it's hard to see, but um, SB1 is a long-term funding package. It provides $5.2 billion statewide, and it's a critical element in our uh, funding for our particularly Measure M projects. It's an ongoing uh, multi-billion dollar commitment, and as I mentioned, it provides $5.2 billion statewide. The funds are important in Los Angeles County. We estimate that Los Angeles County as a whole will see about a billion dollars a year in new investment from the gas taxes and fees that are authorized by SB1. This comes through funding uh, that is uh, both through formula programs and the discretionary programs in SB1. And assuming the money stays in place, and that's all dependent on Proposition 6, it'll help to fund uh, priority projects at Metro but as you just heard, uh, priority projects at the city of Los Angeles. Uh, as was just mentioned, a portion of the SB1 funds goes directly to uh, the cities. Uh, the, it, all the, there's money that goes directly to all 88 cities in Los Angeles County. And we were fortunate to receive a grant from the CTC of almost $2 billion for a number of projects uh, uh, just this past year. Those projects are going to help us deliver the Measure M projects, expand public transit, reduce congestion, and improve air quality. The money's constitutionally protected. It's, uh, the voters approved Prop 69 uh, earlier this year, so all of the money that is from transportation will go to transportation. Uh, as I mentioned, it'll fund Measure M projects, local streets and roads, but this is also the first time that the state has committed ongoing funds to goods movement, and I don't have to tell you, the San Pedro uh, Bay Port Complex is the largest port complex in the nation, handles 40% of the nation's cargo, and this is the first time the state will commit funds to ease the movement of that cargo through our region. So why would the funding go away? Obviously with Prop 6 on the ballot, if Prop 6 passes, that $5.2 billion goes away. Uh, there is no replacement. Uh, there's been a lot of talk about what kind of money could be used uh, to uh, replace this money. That money is either already dedicated to existing state services or could have significant impact uh, to, uh, to some of the other services provided by the state. As we mentioned, SB1 is fixing potholes. It's fixing potholes in every city in the county. Uh, it's making the streets safer for bikes, pedestrians, scooters, everything. Uh, this is how much money is coming directly to the cities from SB1. It's $272 million each year. 
It comes from various fund sources, but if Prop 6 passes, that figure gets cut in half. So just to put a point on it, if Prop 6 passes, every city in Los Angeles County will have 50% of what they currently have to fix local streets and roads. It's expanding transit. And this is one of the big benefits for SB1 for Metro. It's ex uh, expanding a number of transit projects in Los Angeles County, including bringing a new light rail line to the East San Fernando Valley, delivering the West Santa Ana branch projects, which connects the cities of Southeast Los Angeles County into, Los An into downtown Los Angeles. Of course, the Green Line in Torrance, which is not in the city of LA, but connecting the North Hollywood uh, Universal, excuse me, the North Hollywood Red Line Station to Pasadena with new bus rapid transit. We'll be studying uh, a BRT or bus rapid transit on Vermont Boulevard in the city of Los Angeles. And of course the Green Line, the Gold Line, which currently goes from LA, downtown LA, out to um, Azusa, will now go to Montclair. This chart shows the Transit Intercity Capital Rail Program, and these are the transit projects I just mentioned, and you can see the funding award on the right of over a billion dollars uh, to those transit projects. SB1 is also helping to improve highways. Caltrans uh, is getting a dedicated source of funding for uh, maintenance programs, and you know it might sound like a small thing to pick up the trash and clean up the landscaping in Los Angeles County, but these are also major uh, resurfacing projects and safety projects throughout, uh, throughout Southern California. In, Los in the city of Los Angeles, Caltrans is going to be restriping a number of freeways, the 5, the 101, and the 10, and with a, a potential need for autonomous vehicles. And if anybody has a lane detection system in your car, the, the, your car needs to see the lane. And Caltrans is now going to be restriping a number of freeways with that money. Another important aspect of this is bridge safety. There are a number of bridges throughout Los Angeles County that are deficient, and Caltrans will now have funds to uh, bring those bridges into safe condition. It's also helping to ease congestion. This money is going to help build the airport metro connector. Uh, we also have, as you know, one of the largest airports in, in the country. And uh, completing the airport connector will help uh, connect people to the airport by rail. This again is some, one of the other uh, discretionary programs from SB1 is the Solutions for Congested Corridors, and that's where we got the funding for the airport connector. As I mentioned, this is the first infusion of funds for goods movement. There was a one-time investment in 2006 from Proposition 1B, but this is the first time that there will be ongoing dedicated uh, funds for goods movement in, Los Ange in the state. Uh, this will help ease congestion at the ports, help get the goods out of the ports as quickly as possible, and also help clean up the air around the ports. And here you can see the specific projects and the dollar amounts that were funded from that program. It's also helping to clean the air. Uh, the region actually needs our transit projects in order to meet the state's conformity requirements. So building our projects will uh, create significant reductions in greenhouse gas emissions in our region. This is just one of the other discretionary pr uh, programs. Uh, should also mention sound walls. There's a huge backlog of sound walls on the freeways in Los Angeles County. We actually got, a, a, if you think about the number that's needed overall, we actually got a small amount here of $5 million for sound walls in La Cañada. But there is a long list of sound walls within the city of Los Angeles that needs to be funded. And this program could provide that funding in the long term. Uh, with that, let me conclude with just a couple of statistics about the benefits of our projects overall. Generally, our projects leverage $7 billion in local and federal investments. So with the SB1 funds, we're, we're, we're able to leverage $7 billion in other funds. We're gener from Metro's projects alone, we're generating 30,000 jobs. The amount of greenhouse gas emissions we reduce in our region is almost 16 million cubic tons. We also reduce vehicle miles traveled of almost 800,000 hours uh, a year based on our investments. So all of these benefits are threatened if Prop 6 passes. Madam President, that concludes my remarks. There are no members. Do I have Mr. Corn? All right. Uh, thank you very much, Mr. President. If, if members uh, have any questions uh, for our panelists, um, this would be the time. If not, um, I think uh, we just saw a, a pretty clear cost-benefit analysis. Uh, to save 30 cents a day, 
the voters of Los Angeles who would support uh, Prop 6 would be giving up the opportunity to have sound walls to, to provide peace and quality of life in their neighborhood. They would be giving up uh, half of our quarter of a billion dollar investment in street improve, local street improvements. The $35 million this year in transportation projects that we've set aside SB1 funding for, as well as ongoing future uh, revenues forever uh, that, that would also be used for that purpose. Um, we're giving up the opportunity to prevent the kind of damage to automobiles that one of our speakers talked about. The costs of this measure are tremendous. Um, the, the savings that would be realized by this measure are paltry. And I just think that it's critically important that people understand that this is not the time for us to reverse our course on fixing Los Angeles and fixing our transit uh, future and transportation future. So uh, thank you, Madam President, and thank you to our, our speakers for coming and making that case for us. Thank you, Mr. Kerkorian. There are no speakers on the queue. Let's go ahead and um, vote on this on this um, item, item 15. Let's open the roll. Close the roll and tabulate the vote. Thank you. 11 ayes. Thank you. Unfortunately, we're in a country of no brains. So. Oh, I know. At least it's go ahead. I, well, I, I, I believe nothing. I believe nothing. Let's go ahead and take up multi-card speakers. The first speaker is Herman. You still here? You're speaking on items. You're speaking on items eight, seventeen, eighteen, nineteen A, nineteen B, nineteen C, and nineteen D. And your general public comment. Did you say item eight, mommy? Go ahead and start. Well, due to the transportation report, to expand Los Angeles Department of Transportation, I'm here in opposition. I'm here in opposition because when I attended the Metro meeting and was supporting Boyle Heights, and Pacoima, Silmar, Eric Garcetti decided to walk out of the board meeting for some apparent reason because he didn't want to know whether or not a part of the, the no low grant was going to provide me with a free pass to ride the Metro or use the dash or use the LADOT. But because of Proposition A, and vote no on yes to six. We see that Metro's next generation of buses are not required to cover people with disabilities. For example, item 10C. Within 180 days, a comprehensive data analyst transit service seniors is to help a population of disabled people identified for overlapping services and gaps. Yeah, just the other day when I was going to the Metro building, the goddamn green line or whatever line you people have wasn't working right. So I was sitting there in anxiety because the train wouldn't move. And for some reason, some lady kept telling me, it's okay, sir, don't get upset. I says, no, God damn it! this train needs to get me to the Metro board meeting immediately. One minute for your general public comment. So I do have a complaint that ties elected officials to situations of provoking me and confronting me with my triggers of disability. Now, whether or not Herb Wesson is having an episode of psychiatric disability or not, or that England or the tyrant is suffering from a mental breakdown, I want to know whether or not 
42 U.S.C. 121.02 through and 28 CFR 36.105 protects me. Protects me under the ADA 42 U.S.C. 121.02 through 28 CFR 36.105, which prohibits discrimination. So stop triggering my disability, assholes. Sir, uh, Wayne Spindler. Okay, um, Mr. Spindler, you're speaking on items 8, 17, 19. I'm sorry, 8, 17, and 18, 19, A through D. Go ahead. Thank you, Mommy. So, we got here number 8. Number eight, we support number eight on behalf of the critics. I had a talk with uh, Mr. Cedillo, a.k.a. Cedillo. He's going to give me a dash bus now, later. So one, eight, one A, B, C, we support. But no on number D, Playa Vista does not need a spur to the commuter express lane 437. This is in Mike Bonin's district. They have enough money. Fuck them, and let's give that money over to the downtown area and add additional services to Chinatown through downtown LA. We don't need to be giving these wealthy scumbags who vote for Mike Bonin any more money. But also what I like is how we're stealing the transportation funds under MECLA. What is MECLA? The Municipal Investment Corporation of Los Angeles. And what do they do? None of you have attended the meeting, but that's why current price is running out of the room when I say Mikla, because he and Dell Richardson Price have been taking millions from it. We just need the money to go into the pockets of our bus drivers. Also, give the bus drivers on the dash an 11% increase in pay. They're not getting paid enough for what they got to go through. They're doing a hell of a good job. They're not paid pursuant to the contract, renegotiated with an 11% pay rate, effective retroactively to 2016. So that's the thing to go. So now, the general comment, where is our friend Jose Huzar, a.k.a. Jose Huizar. Come on now, where's Jose? Where's our favorite alcoholic council member? Where is our favorite philanderer? Where is he? You know where he is? He's figuring out how much his tax bill is going to be because all of the private services he's been using with taxpayer-funded staff, he's going to have to declare that and pay money on the taxes for those benefits he's stolen from the public treasury. See, when you do a bad job, I'm the first to say so. Now, on a good note, Nuri Martinez was on KFI and KNX. She's battling human trafficking in her district, doing a damn good job. See, good job by Nuri Martinez. That's the way I am. Next speaker, Eric Previn. Good morning, Mr. Previn. Uh, you're going to speak on items 17, 18, 19 through D, and item 8. Right. Go ahead. Thank you, Councilmember Martinez. It's Eric Previn from Studio City. I'm speaking on behalf of myself. And uh, item 8 is a, a bit of a whopper because the you got a $25 million in MICLA corporation commercial paper and then 7a says that it set up a new fund in which you guys can basic, basically determine what to do authorized by council and so I just hope that that's not pre-granting any kind of changes and that you don't then have to come back and make specific this has been an effort to make it clear so I don't want to diminish the fine work on item 8 but that does uh, concern me and we're talking about a lot of money and the, the cost for commercial paper is not insubstantial and I know that this is how we roll but we have a lot of financial needs so I ask you to look at that I also I wonder about if it's really um, 
impractical or impossible or undesirable to have competitive bidding here at City of Los Angeles as we roll a car dealership from one uh, Glendale Kia to nine cars 911 in Cedillo's. Now, car dealers is of a zeitgeisty issue because they were upstairs uh, at the violation chamber during the public safety special meeting uh, on Wednesday this week, uh, trying to get some kind of, uh, actually it was budget and finance, trying to get some kind of uh, waiver of gross receipt tax which is being studied carefully by Bloomingfield, fortunately, so we'll get a, a report back on that. Now, when it comes to preferential parking districts, i.e. eating up all of the available parking for the residents only, uh, there's no bigger leader than Mike Bond and, and Salita Reynolds. They have been trying it, and Krikorian was trying to help in our district. People would love to do this because it ingratiates the uh, landowners to help when it comes time for uh, it's easy, by the way, to raise $25,000 in Paul Kretz's district, just for the record. He'll confirm that. You can ask Ebenstein or Paul Kretz. It is easy to raise money during a campaign when you're in the richest district that has $95,000 average wage. But if you're in Mr. Harris Dawson's district, where it's only $25,000 average wage, it's very hard, especially against a guy who was being lathered up by Danny Bakewell, Herb West, and Mark Ridley-Thomas in the VIP tent. So as I round the corner, this is my general public comment, I assume? Thank General you, Councilmember Comment. Martinez. Mm -hmm. I would ask you personally, as a leading Democrat in California, I'm a member of the Democratic Party, but I speak on behalf of myself, to get your people out of the bunker. It is time to talk in Studio City. Tonight and next November 2nd, we are ready to have a discussion. We are not people like the debate that you put on as a comic show in Burbank the other night where you invite a bunch of rabid hostile people and then you say see what's the point of talking to anybody who wants to have a discussion with uh, an incumbent here in LA that is not happening okay this is Studio City California not once again Studio City Wisconsin Mr. Bonin do you get the reference we don't want to ignore some of the people who we know are going to pull the lever for Brad Sherman Everybody loves pulling the lever for Brad Sherman. Nothing wrong with that. Send the fella in. We'd like to ask him some questions. He likes to have a town hall where he's in charge, and that points to the whole detail about town halls and debates. The campaign finance ordinance has to have two debates in the primary and two in the general, and nothing else Thank will cut it. Thank you very much, Mr. Previn. And get rid of the threshold as well. Thank, Thank you, you, Mr. Previn. The next speaker is Ms. Uh, Antonia Ramirez. Are you still here? Followed by Patricia McAllister. Uh, Ms. Ramirez, you've only filled out cards for items number 8. And 13. And your general public comment. Sorry, I filled it out for 8 and 13. That, that, uh, item 13, the public comment was already satisfied. Okay. So we're not, we're not hearing public comment on 13. So now you're just down to 8. Okay. And okay. your general public comment, okay? Okay. Thank you very much. Yes, we've been pleading for DASH services to go well after 6.30 p.m. in operation of DASH services on weekends and um, from 7 a.m. to 11 p.m. because regular metros doesn't cover these DASH route areas and it's lengthy walk to walk um, into those areas that DASH walk, drives in and out of. Um, I would like to speak on item number eight, of course. Monday through Friday, we are asking that they provide a DASH from Monday through Friday in downtown primarily on weekends and on um, after hours, after 6.30 to 11 p.m. And on subsection B, wrong. Don't decrease dash buses frequency to every 15 minutes, but to every 10 minutes, Monday through Friday, and have dash operate every 15 minutes on weekends from 6 a.m. to or 7 a.m. to 10 or 11 p.m. Remember, tourism, trade, and commerce. Um, the night cultural life, remember we talk about that. And uh, thank you. Thank you, now your general public and, comment. Um, Stop the homeless racketeering. The city of Los Angeles politicos are committing inexcusable fraud, waste, and abuse, corruption, by first and foremost unlawfully ha housing these goddamn Chango Latino wetbacks and gangbangers at the New Bridge trailer at 711 North Alameda Street, LA, California. These criminal, wicked felons, uncivilized savages, and undesirables belong in prison, jail, and or deported, not freely housed, attract taxpayers' money. We are subsidizing these 
goddamn fucking wet bags. Furthermore, your poor choice in hiring these unethical, inefficient, inept, uh, criminally run staff, Waldo, Daniel, Perla, and Asha, who never were forthright with the LAPD officers when they arrived at the trailers during the rounds um, when making public safety and criminal inspections. Um, they were Officer Haskell and Tavares, and Flores and Figueroa, and Prude and Haskell, and Tavares and um, Berbera and Taranco and Bibenco. Thank you, officers. The staff did not report Thank you very the much, Ms. Ramirez. Thank, Thank you very you. much. Um, Ms. McAllister, you're up next. And ma'am, you are speaking on items, item 17. Yes, item 17. And your general public comment. Yes, item 17. Here you want to um, give uh, Council District 8 $10,000 for overtime salaries for cleaning up and you want to take the money from the Furniture Revenue Fund. Now, I've noticed, I keep track of this, I studied accounting. Every year, you're creating about 100 funds. That's where you, you, you put the money in, so that you, you know what you're doing with it. Why are you giving him $10,000 out of a fund when you've got $28 million in the Bureau of Sanitation and $173 million in the Bureau of Street Services? See, I know how you're switching this money around. You put it in these funds, and then that $10,000 will not be... Um, proven. There are no receipts. When they, I went to the accounting department over in the control and I said, where are the receipts? They said, we don't get any receipts. They just tell us what they do with their money. So that $10,000, who, who knows whose pockets is going in? See, I know the game. You guys are going to be held responsible. We're going to get an audit on this city council. A lot of people are going to get in trouble. I'll come and visit you. Now, your general public comment, Ms. McAllister? I want everybody to listen very carefully. I, I am an intuitive introvert. Intuitive means I can see stuff you don't see. We need these people to, uh, to, to go to prison. And I say prison, we need them locked up in the, um, for treason, for treason. Right now, we got these people who come in here, these are the troops of these Democrats. Don't, I want you to listen very carefully. You know that when they made these sanctuary cities and they said, we are gonna protect these criminals from being deported, those are their troops. They've got 35 to 50 million of them here now, and those who are coming here, those are their troops. We need Bill and Hillary Clinton, George Soros, Nancy Pelosi, and Maxine Waters to be in prison for treason. Now, they may not you know, have to go through it, but we need them right now because they're the ones who are giving these directives out to these people. If one person fires a shot when they come to that border, all of them are going to be killed. So, see, this is very serious. Very serious. I want American, the American citizens to, to, to weapon up, get your weapons out, and buy some more. Thank you, Ms. McAllister. Uh, members, we're going to go ahead and vote on um, item number eight as amended. Let's open the roll. Close the roll and tabulate the vote. Ten eyes. Okay, let's go ahead and vote on items 17, 18, and 19. Let's open the roll. Close the, close the roll and tabulate the vote. Ten eyes. Okay, Madam Clerk, you can go ahead and read item 16. 16A and B, there is a request to continue those two items to November 21st, 2018. Without objection, that will be the order, Mr. Herman. Let's go ahead and um, wrap up the general public comment cards. Roger Hilmer, are you here? Followed by Ryan Farse. Ryan, are you still here? Okay, general public comment, you have one minute. Good morning. Uh, thank you, City Council. Uh, my name is Roger Hilmer. I'm here actually as a volunteer for the Azusa Lighthouse Mission. That's the Azusa Lighthouse Mission. They're located at 411 East 5th Street. Uh, they've been down there since 2001, feeding, clothing, sheltering, rehabilitating, and uh, coaching homeless people on Skid Row. Uh, currently, the uh, mission has a $250,000 liability with uh, building code violations. They are in an old building. It's not an uncommon scenario. I know you guys are used to it. Um, I don't know what else to do, so I'm just here trying to spread the word. I, I'm, I'm asking everyone here to please spread the word about this mission, the Azusa Lighthouse mission. They're currently feeding 200 people a day on Skid Row. Uh, they have a capacity of 15 people per night to stay uh, to, in their quarters. Uh, on any given night, they have over 10 people staying there on the path uh, to independence. Uh, the Azusa Lighthouse Mission can nurse people from the street to independence, to self-sufficiency. It's a process that typically takes six months to two years. Um, this city, this mission not only needs to exist, it needs to grow. So please spread the word about the Azusa Lighthouse Mission. I'll be contacting Thank you very Thank much, you. Roger. Thank you, very Thank much. you. We appreciate you being here. 
Next speaker is uh, Ryan Farsi. General Public Comment, go ahead. Hello, Los Angeles, how are you? Sir, can you please not yell into the mic? It makes it Sorry, very difficult for our translator. Hello, Los Angeles, how are you? I hope you guys are ready for the 509 first pitch. Los Angeles Dodgers versus the Boston, Cel Boston, Boston Red Sox. I need Dodger Nation to be wearing all blue, so the rest of you that are not wearing blue today, please wear blue. And uh, I just want to let everyone know that I'm the proud new owner of the water permit 49597 in the state of Oregon. The address is 1330 West Main Street in Sheridan, Oregon. The zip code is 97378. I've la landed in the opportunity zone of Donald Trump's tax plan. So I have a gift for Los Angeles, a Donald Trump bobblehead. I love Donald Trump and I love Governor Brown, but I don't really like them. I'm here to help you guys. They're really a big problem for us. We need to figure out what to do with them. God bless America. Go Dodgers! Let's go, sir, let's go. Sir, on you're done. Thank Dodgers. you very much. I'm going to ask you one more time not to yell into the mic. Thank you. Members, um, we're going to bring back item number 16 for reconsideration. Um, and A and B as well. On item 16, A and B. Let's go ahead and vote on reconsideration. Let's open the roll. Close the roll and tabulate the vote. Ten eyes. Okay, those items are now before us. I will move to go ahead and confirm both lean. It will be seconded by Mr. Cedillo. That item is now before us. Let's go ahead and open the roll. Close the roll and tabulate the vote. Thank you very much. Ten Madam eyes. Clerk, what's next? Um, that brings motions for posting and referral. Okay, posted and referred members. Are there any announcements? Mr. O'Farrell. Thank you, Madam President. I just want to let everyone know that we have a free screening of the film Coco tomorrow evening at Echo Park Lake on the eve of Halloween. Uh, it's a wonderful film, free uh, to everyone who uh, wants to attend uh, and see this wonderful Oscar-winning animated film from, from Disney. Thank you very much, Mr. Six o'clock. Six o'clock. Thank you very much, Mr. Price. Thank you, Madam President. Just wanted to invite neighbors and friends out to the CD9 Dia de los Muertos Festival uh, tonight, we're going to be at South Park, live entertainment, there's vendors, altars, arts and crafts, food, it's going to be a, a festive time uh, for all. We've got uh, uh, several, this, the acts from the stage will begin about five uh, through seven, and uh, everyone is invited to come out and have some fun. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Price. Are there any other announcements, members? Can we please all rise for adjourning motions, including the members of the public? Okay, Mr. O'Farrell. Thank you, Madam President. Uh, um, I rise today to honor the life of LADOT traffic officer Gabriel Acosta and his family is assembled right here in the front row and his city family stands in solidarity with them. Um, Mr. Acosta has passed away uh, while on duty on July 21st of this summer. Officer Acosta was struck by a vehicle while directing traffic at a special event he fought for his life, but sadly passed away on October 6th. With his passing, the Department of Transportation and the entire city family suffered a tragic loss of one of our very own. Officer Acosta was an outstanding officer and well-liked by everyone who knew him. He loved his city family and was known for his dedication to his duties and for his consideration for his fellow officers. He was highly respected by his supervisors and colleagues. He ex exemplified the very best in our parking enforcement division. Officer Acosta was born on March 29, 1975 in Guadalajara, Mexico. He came to this country as a young boy and later served in the Army for 16 years, from 93 to 09. He joined the city in the Department of Transportation in June of 2003. Most recently, he was assigned to the Hollywood Parking Enforcement Area Office. Officer Acosta is the second parking enforcement officer killed in the line of duty this year. This tragic loss of life should serve to deepen our appreciation and respect for these dedicated individuals who serve with honor and a mission to serve the people of Los Angeles. We are reminded again of the risks that our parking enforcement professionals 
assume every day in their work for the public good. We pray for their safety and thank them for their dedication. Officer Acosta is survived by his wife, Melissa, son, Gabriel Jr., daughters, Sarah and Tiffany, his father, Jose, mother, Theodora, brothers, George, Jose, and Ivan, and sisters, Janet, Veronica, and Nancy. In addition, he is served by many extended family members who are dealing with the shock of this unbelievable loss. He's also survived, as I mentioned, by his city family, and they are a family, his fellow LADUT officers. Within this family of parking enforcement officers, there's a special bond of mutual support and respect. And this bond is especially felt when one of our own is lost, and Officer Acosta's colleagues send their deepest condolences to his family. Los Angeles Department of Transportation and Los Angeles Police Department are actively supporting Officer Acosta's family in this time of need. And I want the family to know that we all hold Officer Acosta in our memory with love and honor. He was definitely one of us, um, will always be one of us, and we extend our heartfelt and sincere condolences to the family, and we say in one voice, may he rest in peace. Thank you, Mr. Um, O'Farrell. Mr. Rue. Thank you, Madam President, and thank you, Councilman O'Farrell, for uh, leading this adjournment. I would also like to join this adjournment, uh, adjourning motion for Officer G Gabriel Acosta and extend my deepest thanks and condolences to the to the family here today and to the Los Angeles Department of Transportation traffic officers that are all here at present. This has been a very difficult year for our city's traffic officers um, to lose not one, but two dedicated and beloved officers. And it's difficult to um, wrap our heads around this. And as Councilman Bro Farrell said, Officer Acosta was one of our own. His, lo his loss is a pain shared by us all. And I want the family and our traffic officers to know that we are grieving with you. It isn't said often enough, but the work that you do as the Los Angeles Transpor Department of Transportation traffic officers is incredibly valuable and incredibly important work. In a city with more roadways and more traffic than nearly any other city in North America, Los Angeles traffic officers serve on the front lines often in difficult and dangerous situations. Gabriel Acosta was a dedicated traffic officer, a father, a friend, and a member to our city family. We pray for his family, we pray that he rests in peace, and we stand in support of all the men and women of the department today and every day. Thank you for your service and my deepest sympathy for your loss. Thank you, Mr. Rue, and um, to the officer, um, the family of Officer Acosta, on behalf of each member of the City Council, our deepest and sincere condolences for your loss. Um, thank you for being here. I'd like to ask uh, Mr. O'Farrell and Mr. Rue if all members of the City Council can be added to this adjournment. Thank you very much. Members, are there any other adjournments? See none. Have a great week, and our meeting is adjourned.
What I enjoy most is being able to fabricate and create and produce items literally from just a concept or an idea that's placed on a piece of paper or, or even an image that you see on a, on a screen. American Furniture Manufacturer supplies furniture for a lot of big name hotels in the Los Angeles market and all throughout California. We focus mainly on commercial clients and to make it commercial, you, uh, it needs to be very, very durable, very high quality. My father, Harry, started this company in 2004. I personally joined the company in 2008. As vice president, my day-to-day -day tasks include everything that you need to do to run a business, reviewing design, scheduling and coordinating logistics, as well as accounting and uh, anything else you can think of. Most of the things that I learned um, and our success now has been through experience and on-the-job experience. I would say what makes AFM contract unique is the fact that we're very punctual, very transparent, and cost conscientious to the client. American Furniture Manufacturer would have 65 employees uh, in California altogether. Internationally, in Indonesia and in China, where we also have factories, um, those combined can range up to the thousands. We mainly ship through the Port of LA. Per month, approximately, we import about 30 to 40 containers. We were drawn to Pomona, California because the property in this area